So, when it comes to Blender Tutorials, what you're about to watch is Return of the King, the final installment of the trilogy. In part one, The Fellowship of the Ring, I showed you how to make the corridor in 3D, so we have this 3D environment that our camera moves through. Then in The Two Towers, which some people think is the best movie, which is nonsense, I showed you how to make the slinky animation, which is also going down the corridor. So now, in Return of the King, which is the one who won the Oscar, so hopefully I can live up to that promise, in this part, we are going to combine everything together, so slinky plus the corridor all together. We're gonna need to talk about volumetric, some camera shake to make it look more realistic, compositing materials. Basically, this is just the episode that makes me not need to record a fourth one. It's gonna be a mismatch of a whole bunch of nonsense. So hopefully you're fucking ready because it's about to get insane. Part three, Return of the King. I think we should probably begin. So we left off with the animation now also in our corridor. So this is what our blend file looks like currently. And really the goal of this is to get it from here, which kind of has all the assets to something we can hit render and be proud of something we can put on our fridge. So I think the first issue with this is the camera animation. So the camera animation right now is doing what I want it to do. Um, in fact, we let's uh, select our viewer camera, which again is different from the projector camera. Go back and watch the previous tutorials if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Basically this just has a keyframe here for the beginning and one for the end and it's going to be changing a whole bunch of stuff mainly location and rotation so it's just following along but the thing is this is kind of too perfect and we want this to look more photorealistic in other words we want it to look like there's a cameraman with shaky hands who doesn't know what he's doing in other words, it needs to have a bit of wobble. To do this, there's a great Ian Hubert tutorial about this, but to do this, we're gonna be using the same method. Uh, go to the graph editor, which shows us all our uh, keyframes, all our graphs for this animation. Uh, namely, we are interested in, let's open this up. Uh, we are interested in the X Euler rotation. In other words, we are looking at the X component of the rotation, which is this one. It's the one that wobbles up and down, unlike the others that go side to side and like left to right, right? So we're interested in this X component because that's the one that wobbles the most during uh, animation. And when we have this selected, you can see right now there's not much going on, but if we hit N, apply a modifier. So right now we are changing the animation itself using procedural animation. We are gonna add a noise modifier. Well, let's zoom out. Uh, you can see now we have, we have our camera shake. There you go, we've added our realism. We've got a, our coked out dude <laughs> just recording this thing. Uh, we wanna take this noise and just make it less intense, right? So first of all, it's happening too frequently. There's too much, like it's happening too fast. Uh, so you're gonna take this first scale slider and just smooth it out a lot. So now it's, uh, it's a bit better. Maybe we should do even more. So now we have kind of like a less frequent shake, but of course the magnitude, the strength of the shake is still crazy. And that's what this uh, second strength slider is for. So I'm gonna make it instead of one, I'm gonna make it 0 0.1, a tenth of the strength. Um, and you can see visually this just makes it less intense. And now we have something that looks a tiny bit better. Um, what we can do is let's slow this down even more to something like seven, just so it's very minimal. And let's see what that looks like. So already kind of looks a, a bit more realistic. Um, generally, the last thing I tend to change with this uh, noise modifier, this procedural camera shake, is add a bit of depth, which you can think of as kind of like the roughness of this curve. So if you add that, it kind of looks like a mountain ridge um, instead of smooth. You don't want to make this too much because then it's going to have too many fine motions. Uh, so what I recommend is just having a depth of one which just adds a bit of uh, a little bit of extra inconsistency that we wouldn't have gotten before. Um, so I think we are pretty happy with this. In fact, let me slow it down just a bit more and let me make it just a bit stronger. So there's a bit more variation, but less frequently. And there you go. We have a bit of a camera noise, a bit of a camera shake. Uh, you can also do this with your other rotation components. So Y and Z. Um, I'm just gonna add a tiny bit to the Z component and you can forget about why it's not too important. It's actually gonna look a bit weird if you add too much. And I like that we kind of have a Dutch angle thing going on and I don't wanna ruin that. So Z Euler rotation, same thing. You're gonna add noise, uh, which is gonna be at a different part of the graph. It's gonna be blue for this one. We scale it up to something like nine and then we make it way, way less intense. Something like 0.1 and even that's a bit much. We could divide that by two and add a depth of one. Okay, so now we have a bit of a camera shake. You can always make this more or less intense depending on you know what kind of shot you have. Uh, for me, I'm gonna make it a bit less intense. And I think at this point we can say that our camera shake is good. So what does this look like? It looks like our camera with a bit of wobble that you can barely see unless you're looking at it from the perspective of the camera. So uh, at this point we have realistic-ish camera motion and the next step is to make our slinky 
not look like a piece of white plastic unless that's what you're going for. We want ours to be metallic, reflecting the environment, which is the nice thing about creating our three-dimensional environment. It can actually be in the reflection, so let's do that next. Really is a mismatch, mishmash? How do you say that word? It really is a collection of random topics just thrown together into the uh, finale. To do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the shading workspace. This is where we make our materials, of course, and let's have, I'm sorry for the camera going up and down. It just moves whenever my mouse is in the corner. Uh, we are going to select, if I can find it, I'm gonna select my slinky mesh and create a new material. And for this one, let's uh, actually visualize all our nodes. Uh, for this one, we are just going to make it uh, full metallic. You don't want to do anything between zero and one. Zero means not metallic, one means metallic. Stuff in between doesn't really make sense. Uh, we're going to make it metallic and then a bit less rough, in other words, a bit shinier. So something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. This slinky right now is a bit too bright for my liking, so I'm just going to dip that down a little. And the main trick, if you're using Eevee, again, if you're using Cycles, it's going to be photorealistic, at least more so. Uh, the trick with Eevee to get this to look more realistic is actually not in the material. You're going to go to the render properties, and I want you to enable screen space reflections, which you can see does a big difference. So this is the before and after. So this is going to make it actually reflect what is in screen space, what can be seen on screen. It's a bit of a hack. Uh, but that's why Eevee runs so fast, because it's made out of hacks like this. And this gives us much more realistic uh, reflections. And also we can make this a bit darker depending on the uh, depth of darkness. That makes no sense that you want for your slinky. Um, some other quick things while we are in the render tab. Let me just go back to a frame where it's contacting the ground a bit more. Uh, it would probably make sense to enable ambient occlusion. This is just going to add a bit of contact shadow which is actually gonna make it look like our slinky is interacting with the ground a little bit more. You can also enable bloom, although right now uh, there's no light source bright enough for that to matter. Um, so I think, unless you wanna add some clear code or anything weird like that, if you just want a nice metallic slinky, uh, we have now done that. So now we are on to the next part, which is volumetrics or atmospherics. Um, in other words, if you look at this shot right now, it kinda is starting to look realistic. Uh, but it's kind of suffering from that Jimmy Neutron. There's not enough stuff going on uh, in the shot. And also, yeah, just <laughs> it also just doesn't look very real. So let's add some atmospherics. To do this, we're going to do the easy method. We are just going to add in a cube. And anything inside this cube is going to have fog. So just scale this up so it consumes our entire scene. And then for the shading workspace, and let's actually uh, view the outside of this cube. We are going to give the cube itself a material but we don't want a surface material, we want a volumetric material, since this is gonna be a volume, it's gonna be inside the cube, giving it uh, fog and mist and all that. Connect this to the volume, and you can see already this gives it a nice smoke. And before we continue, if you're using EV volumetrics, just make those uh, volumes a bit more refined. And you can see, if we go to our camera view, uh, it's kind of like too cloudy to see anything, so you can just bring down the density, in other words, how strong the uh, smoke is or the uh, volume. So right now it's still very high, but you can still kind of see what's going on. So this is kind of like having too much atmospherics in our shot. Uh, you can keep bringing this down until it's just kind of like a mist occupying our space. So maybe even divide this by two. So this is uh, with it and this is without. So without, with, you can see really does add something. And if we were to give this kind of like a yellowish kind of grungy, dusty color. It will look more like a old corridor, which, you know, this thing already does look like that. So this kind of really depends on your shot, what you want. Uh, but I'm not gonna stop there. This is Return of the King. I'm just gonna show you how to make uh, volumes in a cube and that's it. Uh, no, we're gonna make it more procedural and in some sense more realistic. So do we, bleh, we do not want a uh, uniform fog. In fact, we want some areas to be dustier and uh, mistier than others. So how do we do that? Well, instead of having a single density value that controls the density everywhere, what we can do is we can in fact use noise, a noise texture, yes, not only for surface, but for volumes. Uh, this is a three-dimensional quantity that we can visualize in our density. And right now it doesn't really look like it's doing anything, but that's just because we need to add in a bit of a color ramp. And we need to have some areas have way, way less uh, fog so we can see the variation. So take your bottom handle, the black where there is zero fog, and just bring that upwards. And you can see now we have kind of like a cloudy thing, uh, which means that in some areas there's going to be fog and in some areas there won't. Now, of course, we don't want there to be kind of like all or nothing kind of response. 
um, where we have very little fog, we just want it to be subtle. So it doesn't need to be black, just kind of like a uh, very dark gray or something like that. So nowhere is it actually zero, but in some areas it is more intense. And you could do the same thing with the, um, you know, the top slider. You don't need to have like a area with a very, very intense amount of fog. That's up to you. So you could bring that down. Uh, but what I like to do is once we have our color ramp, I'm going to control this using another node outside of it, uh, namely a math node. So right now we just have a bunch of quantities that we could, uh, we could visualize like this. Probably better to visualize it as a volume. Although... <laughs> although it's not working out too well in that uh, regard. What we're gonna do basically is we're gonna multiply this. In other words, we're gonna scale the strength of this by something like 0.5, so make it half as strong. So you can see uh, we can make it more dense, less dense, whatever. Uh, this is our controller for that. So I'm just gonna crank this down until it looks about right. I think this is good. It might, for some people's taste, this is probably way too foggy. Uh, but for me, I'm like, I do want that old looking feel. So. Uh, we have added atmospherics that kind of give our scene depth, which is kind of the whole point of this. So what is the next thing on the docket? Uh, well, we have a realistic camera, but uh, maybe this is just a me thing. I like adding a lot of shallow depth of field. I like stuff being out of focus, and I like also doing focus pulling. So like looking at your finger that's in focus, then at the background you're saying, I want this in focus, then the other thing, and that's called focus pulling, changing the object that's in focus. Uh, namely, for this shot, what I want is I want the background to be in focus, so the slinky's blurred out, and then after like a second, it you know, focuses on the slinky and nothing else, okay? So how do we do something like that? That's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, we, we want to, <laughs> let me try again. First of all, if we select our viewer camera, which is the one that we're viewing out of, we can enable depth of field. If we were to make this very extreme, uh, you can see that right now some stuff's out of focus, and you can kind of choose... You know, right now our slinky's in focus and the background's out of focus, or you could do the reverse. Uh, but we do not want to animate this focus distance. We don't want to choose our f uh, focal plane manually. Instead, I'm going to use a object, focus on object. I'm going to choose an object that it's always going to focus on. How are we going to do this? Well, first of all, let's hide our cube. For now, it's actually pretty distracting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add in an empty. I'm going to add in an empty and position it exactly in the middle of our slinky. So this is gonna be the empty that represents the general motion of our slinky. So I, keyframe location. Then on frame 120, uh, being the last keyframe, we're just gonna move this down to the center again and add another keyframe. So right now, if we were to view this, it should be following, not perfectly. Like you can see sometimes the empty's ahead and sometimes it's behind. And that's because our slinky goes with a linear kind of motion. In other words, the interpolation is linear. It doesn't speed up or slow down. Whereas our empty does have Bezier interpolation. So you just hit T and instead of Bezier, you're gonna hit linear. And now our empty is gonna be kind of dead center of this motion. Okay, so you're thinking, fine, now we have an object to focus on. So you're like, okay, empty 005. Uh, we can select our camera, let's view it, and then you're like, okay, we make this the object that we focus on. And that will do exactly what you think. So right now we have our shallow depth of field, but our slinky is always in focus. Um, that's fine, but it's not necessarily what I said I wanted. I wanted to do some focus pulling where first the background's in focus, and then this. So in fact, in fact, um, our empty is not enough. We're going to need to add in a second empty that is parented to this one, uh, to get what we want, and you'll understand in a second. So first, let's duplicate Shift D, and let's uh, remove the keyframe. So now we have one empty that's just here, and then the other one that follows with it. You can see it's following with it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have this empty, and I'm going to shift click. I'm going to have it parented to the other. So that's Control P, and then Enter. So now you can see. Whoops, I think I messed that up. Let's try that one more time. What we're going to do is we are gonna have this empty parented to this one. So shift click, control P, object, boom, and this one doesn't have any keyframes. So you can see now they are moving together, one's following the other, uh, but it's not necessarily one on top of the other, which is kind of the point because we can have our empty start off over here, something like that. So it's focused on the background. We'll put a keyframe there. And then after let's say 30 frames, it's gonna go uh, right on top of this. So just kind of have it be on top, and then they are going to move together. So in other words, uh, we have kind of a additional degree of freedom where first uh, we can have our empty move around, and then it can move with the motion of the slinky. And this is going to be our focus object. So let's actually give it a name. We can call this thing focus. 
So right now, if we were to enable this as the new focus object, so I have the viewer camera, we are gonna change this to focus right there. You're gonna see that in the beginning, our slinky is gonna be out of focus. Why? Because the empty's back here. And then after 30 frames, this is gonna go into focus. And now we can just kind of play around with the aspects, the properties of our depth of field. So I'm gonna make this more intense, 0.15. So some stuff's really out of focus and then the slinky's really in focus and the background's out of focus. And this is just the, you know, kind of like filming an ant kind of a depth of field kind of situation. Maybe uh, you don't want it to have, have it be as extreme as I'm doing it here, uh, but you know, screw what you want. This is what I'm doing. So here we go. We have our realistic camera motion. At least we have some uh, camera shake is what I mean. We have our depth of field. We have our materials. We have our atmospherics, which by the way, now that I'm looking at this kind of completed, um, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, now that I'm looking at this kind of completed, I do want to make those a bit stronger. Actually, it's because I'm not viewing them, so Alt-H to do that. There we go. Now it's looking nice. My brain just thought, oh, I guess we need stronger atmospherics. No, they were just disabled. And you can see how with depth of field, everything plays together very nicely. So now, uh, the final step really is if you're happy with this, I think in my you know, initial project, I added some dust particles. We're going to skip that. Um, now the question is, are you happy with this? For me, the answer is yes. And the rest of this is just going to be some basic compositing rendering stuff. So let's pick a frame that we want to use as our reference. So probably not this because the slinky is out of focus. Let's pick one like, I don't know. I guess a frame like this is pretty good to give us a vibe of what our shot's gonna look like. Uh, right now we can hit F12 and it's gonna render using EV, so it's gonna be you know three to four seconds. Uh, there you go. Um, so right now this is what it looks like and the rest of our uh, work is gonna be some very basic compositing tricks. So go to the compositing workspace with nodes enabled. Again, the reason we can see this image is because I, uh, I hit render before. If I didn't, this would have been empty, so make sure you do a render preview. Control shift click to have a viewer node so we can actually see what we're doing. And I'm just gonna link these together. So now the name of the game is to add some nodes in between here. So from our initial render to what is being outputted, we add some nodes to give this some visual interest. The first thing I like to do is I like to add in a gamma node. And yes, we could control the gamma from here and it will, you know, change what it looks like interactively. Uh, but I do like putting this as a node so that we don't have to mess with this from the render settings. But it does raise the point that we could use this slider to kind of pick what we want. So I like kind of a darker look, which seems around 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So in other words, we can take our gamma slider, make it like 0.9, or is it inverted here? That's the interesting thing. I guess it is inverted. So you want to make it instead of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, it'd be 1.1, 1.2. So you can see now it's nice and dark. So I'm going to go with 1.15 for this. So that, that's something I actually never looked into, the gamma being different here than here. Okay, so that's the first thing. So this is before and after, just gives us a bit of depth. Next, what I like to do is I like to add in an RGB curves, and this is just kind of like a fancy way to add contrast with more control. So in the darker color, so this is like the shadows and this is the highlights, and right now it's linear, meaning everything's one-to-one. -one. I'm gonna take our shadows and make them a bit darker, in other words, make them lower, and I'm gonna take our highlights, in other words, the area to the right, and make it a bit higher. So it's like contrast, but we're specifically saying make the shadows darker and the highlights higher. Uh, so this is the before and after. You can notice that the parts of the wood that are in shadow are now much darker, and the highlight, uh, the bright area on the metal, is now much brighter. So that's the before and after. And then finally, and this is kind of like a controversial step, I like to add in a bit of lens dispersion. That's kind of like the chromatic aberration, the color splitting that happens on the edge. Uh, so if we were to make this value very big so you can see what it does, uh, you can see it adds quite a bit of color variation and you can have it fit uh, so that it doesn't uh, have the corners of the frame have nothing in there. So that's what dispersion does. So this is zero. Um, I, I like to keep this pretty low at something like 0.1, but you can see at the very uh, corners, and especially with this fog, which makes everything a bit kind of muted and a bit whiter, uh, really does some nice dispersion stuff. So this is before and after. And long story short, if we were to bypass all these nodes, this is our original render, right? It's just kind of this overexposed thing. And then this is our final render. It kind of looks more atmospheric in a lot of ways. Okay, so are we happy with this? I think so. So you just have to picture what we have right now, uh, but with all the uh, compositing steps. And I'd be interested to see uh, what this uh, frame looks like where we actually have our slinky out of focus.
And by the way, while this is rendering, uh, if you use the newer Blender builds, Eevee now has motion blur, and that's what I rendered mine with because I didn't want to use cycles, I wanted it to be fast. And uh, you can actually utilize Eevee's motion blur to have our slinky have motion blur. Uh, I'm not gonna do it for this tutorial, but just know that it exists. Um, so yeah, that actually looks pretty interesting here as well. And uh, about that whole motion blur thing, if you're using 2.83, so I think the motion blur thing's 2.9, uh, you're gonna notice that yes, there's still motion blur, but this is actually only camera motion blur. It's not object motion blur. So since our camera's moving, it is in fact useful, uh, but we're not gonna get motion blur just from the compression of our slinky. But this is this is something worth at, um, enabling. There's no reason not to. Um, and yeah, that that's essentially our shot. You can always like go back and change literally the shape uh, of the slinky or or you can make the slinky brighter or darker, or you can make it a rainbow slinky, which is a tutorial over at the Patreon. Uh, but long story short, you basically do what we did, and instead of hitting render, you hit render animation to export this whole thing. Of course, you wanna choose you know, what kind of file type you want. I use FFmpeg to output a video instead of a image sequence, but that's neither here or there and not relevant to Return of the King. So. Hopefully you enjoyed this tutorial series where I took you from part one to part two, and then in fact to part three. Uh, hopefully you learned a lot. There's a lot of tricks embedded in here, and I dropped my headphones again, just like the end of the last tutorial, I think, unless I edited that out. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, the best way to support this channel, again, I only put this advertisement at the end because, well, anyways, the best way to support this channel is via Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a way for you to get, you know, not only a way to support this channel and keep it going, but you're going to get exclusive tutorials, uh, Discord access, uh, behind the scenes access, project files, like for example, this completed blend, or maybe the original one I made is going to be up there. Uh, but to all 420-ish, you know, it is 420, uh, of you that are active Patreons. Patrons, uh, thank you. Uh, for those of you watching now who want to become patrons, thank you as well. I do appreciate it. You could do it from month to month to month or just disable it one month, whatever you choose. Um, but completely optional. Although you should know that the patrons are what lets these tutorials be free and not paid. Of course, the exclusive tutorials are paid in the sense that they're only for patrons. Uh, but the reason I can make stuff like this free is because other people are kind of carrying the load in some sense. I wouldn't be able to do this full time without them. But long story short, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial series that is free. Uh, Patreon does exist. It would be nice if that is something you're interested in for you to actually follow through on that. But that is your choice. I put this at the end of the tutorial so it wouldn't uh, interfere with your viewing experience. I have been CG Matter Default Cube, uh, now signing off after two half hour tutorials and one like 20 minute tutorial. I hope you learned something and thank you for watching. That's it, that's the show.